Hello everyone. This online lesson covers Portrait of a Loaf of Bread, one of the poems prescribed for the IEB English Home Language Curriculum of 2020 and 2021. This is a South African poem by Oswald Mchali. As always, I would like you to pause here and consider the image on the screen. What do you see? And how do you think it connects with the title of the poem? At the end of the lesson, return to the slide to see if your prediction was correct. Mbuyuseni Oswald Mchali was born in Frehet in 1940. This year, 2020, he therefore celebrates his 80th birthday at his home in Soweto. Mbuyuseni means bring him back, so it's fitting that this poet has returned to Soweto, the place that inspired so much of his writing to spend the last years of his life. Like Chris van Veek, author of I Have My Father's Voice, another poem you have to study this year, Charlie was awarded the Olive Schreiner Prize for his first anthology of poems, Sounds of a Cowhide Drum. Despite the challenges of growing up black in apartheid South Africa, Charlie has been successful as both a writer and as an educator. Most of you know why we have a public holiday on the 16th of June. It's Youth Day. This is to commemorate the uprising of the black youth of South Africa in 1976 to protest the enforced education policy of the apartheid regime that all lessons in black schools were to be taught in the medium of Afrikaans. The government crackdown was harsh. Many people were killed and many students and intellectuals fled the country to live in exile. Some stayed and, like Oswald and Charlie, used their talents to voice their opposition from within the system. Those who wrote protest poetry became known as the Soweto poets. For many white South Africans, the writings of these poets was the first encounter with black voices. For me personally, this meant the opening of a new world during my first year as an English literature student at UCT. Censorship was strictly enforced in the late 1970s and early 1980s. It was the work of poets like Mchali that broke through this barrier. It was the anthology Sounds of a Cowhide Drum that was a seminal collection of South African poems, written in English by a Zulu man about the experiences of black South Africans. I'm sure that you've encountered some poems from this anthology in your earlier years of high school. Our grade eights, for example, usually study Boy on a Swing, in 2014, the anthology was republished, but this time in Isizulu, with Mchali translating the poems himself into his mother tongue. The poems are not obviously protest poems, but by capturing the detail of the experiences of black people as they went about their daily lives, the criticism of the apartheid government is obvious. In fact, it is this understatement that makes the poetry devastatingly ironic. Before we read through the poem, prepare your pages for your own note-taking. This is my preferred method, but it's not the only method. Develop a system that suits your learning style. Here's another way of taking notes. Divide your page into quarters, 
the so-called four square poetry analysis method. Each square has its own heading. One quarter of your page is reserved for notes on the imagery and sound devices employed by the poet. Another quarter is for your notes on tone and attitude. You can, of course, include your notes on mood here as well. A third square is devoted to the style, structure and form of the poem in question. How many lines? How many stanzas? What is the rhyme scheme? What type of poem is it? All of those technical questions are answered here. The final square is where you write about the meaning of the poem, your interpretation, your understanding of the poem's theme or message. Using a method that suits you, let's get started with analysing today's poem. Portrait of a Loaf of Bread Look back to the rolling fields, waving gold-topped wheat stalks, mowed by the reaper's scythe, bundled into sheaves, carted to the mill and ground into flour, kneaded into mountains of dough, to be churned by rollers and spat into pans as red-hot as Satan's cauldron. Brought to the cafe, warmly wrapped in cellophane, by Eat Fresh Bread Bakery Van. For the waiting cook, to slice and toast, to butter and to marmalade, for the food-bedecked breakfast table. Whilst the labourer, with fingers caked with wet cement of a builder's scaffold, Mauls a hunk and cold drink and licks his lips and laughs. Man can live on bread alone. What do you think of when you see a loaf of bread? When you smell a freshly baked loaf? I assume many of you have been improving your home baking skills during the coronavirus lockdown. It's a food that has so many connotations of warmth, of home and hearth, of nourishment. It's even used as an image in the Bible. Christ is said to be the bread of life. It's a food that speaks to the core of our species. It evokes pictures of cooking fires and plenty. Og the caveman experienced it, and we experience it. To the gluten intolerant guys, you'll have to take my word for it. Let's start with the title of the poem. A portrait usually refers to a painting. I'm sure you're all familiar with the Mona Lisa and Girl with a Pearl Earring. It's a painting, and in some cases, a written piece of someone or something that is important to the artist. Generally, anything that is worthy of hours of dedicated time in the artistic process must be of great value to the creator. On this slide, I decided to choose illustrations that are not as obvious as the Mona Lisa. On the left, we have Norman Rockwell's delightful self-portrait. It's so clever. Do you see that it's a triple self-portrait. It caused quite a stir when it went on display. I like the idea that the painter has captured three versions of himself. The middle painting is that of a construction worker. In other words, nobody famous, not a celebrity, 
just a hard-working man earning his daily bread. Did you see what I did there? Strictly speaking, the third picture is not a portrait. It's a still life of a loaf of bread. A rather mundane object to capture on canvas for posterity's sake. Either the poem is in praise of a loaf of bread, or it's an ironic take on the cultural norms of European art, or high art as it is sometimes called. When you have studied the poem, come back to the title and the picture on the opening slides and see whether you think that the title is ironic. Stanza one gives us the setting of the poem. It's an idyllic rural setting, beautiful fields of wheat, a reaper holding his scythe, and the sheaves of wheat piled together, ready for collection. The sheaves of wheat are collected and taken by a cart to the mill, where it will be ground into flour. I am sure that you're all familiar with the English idiom to be a millstone around one's neck, which means to be a heavy burden. If you look at the millstone in the picture on the right, you'll realize what a powerful idiom that is. Do not use it lightly. <laughs> I know a pun is the lowest form of wit, but I do enjoy them. The poem is obviously about the journey undertaken between farmland and table, the genesis of a loaf of bread. Don't you ever wonder about the first person to do this, to take some grass with spiky tops, split the ears and remove the kernel of wheat, bash the kernel until it turns into a white powdery substance, mix it with water, throw it on a fire and then eat it? Well, I'm very glad that they did that, aren't you? The idyllic, peaceful setting of the wheat fields is in juxtaposition with the energy conveyed by the verbs. The fields are rolling. There is personification evident in the waving wheat stalks. The metaphor of the wheat stalks being topped with gold is a reference to this incredible bounty, this wealth given to us by nature. These gentle actions in the present continuous tense give way to the verbs in the past tense. The wheat is mowed, bundled, carted, and ground. By placing these verbs at the beginning of the lines, our attention is focused on the industry, the busyness of the harvest period. Did you notice that the poem begins with a present tense command, an instruction? What is the effect of this? Is the poet asking us to reflect on the past? What do you think? Lines 7 to 10 are indented. It's a deliberate typographical feature utilized by the poet. There is a change here to a description of the hard work required to make a loaf of bread. During the lockdown, I'm sure that many of you kneaded dough, left it to rise and then churned it for a second rising. After that, you would have placed the dough into the prepared bread pans. In this stanza, this process is described, but on an industrial scale. There are mountains of dough. Rollers must be used, not just a single rolling pin. The production line has the lumps of dough being spat into pans as red hot as Satan's cauldron. The beautiful, serene pastoral scenes of lines one to six have changed. This is a factory setting. The reference to Satan's cauldron introduces the extreme heat of the manufacturing process. 
it should make you think of biblical references, which we'll encounter again in the last line of the poem. The progress of the loaf of bread continues from factory to shop. There's a distinct change taking place here. From the idyllic rural setting to the industriousness of the factory production line, to the warmth and coziness of the cafe where people with money purchase food. The loaf of bread is freshly delivered, bought and taken home, where a cook is waiting to serve the bread as toast for the breakfast of the family. Look at the verbs in the stanza. The infinitive form has been used. These verbs describe simple, easy tasks. We can all slice, butter and toast bread. Compare these actions to the kneading, churning and spitting that occurred in the factory and the mowing, bundling, carting and grinding that happened on the farm. The compound adjective in line 17 tells us that there is no shortage of food here. I don't know about you, but I envision a full English breakfast in this stanza. A good fry up of eggs, bacon, bangers, mushroom, tomatoes, and of course, toast with marmalade, rounded off with a cup of English breakfast tea. Did you notice that the word marmalade has been used as a verb here? It's usually a noun meaning a preserve, a jam made out of citrus fruits like oranges or limes. Going hungry is not something that this family has to worry about. And they don't have to prepare the food for themselves either. They have a cook to do that for them. The last stanza introduces a different consumer of bread, the labourer. Note that it is the labourer, not a labourer. The affluent consumers in stanza two are not named. They are treated as faceless, even unimportant people. The labourer represents the working classes, the tradesmen, the artisans, those blue collar workers who literally get their hands dirty, keeping the wheels of industry turning as the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. The verbs are important. This construction worker is famished. He doesn't bother to clean the wet cement from his hands and mauls a hunk of bread. No delicate nibbling of dainty crustless cucumber sandwiches here. He tears into the bread, without butter, and certainly without the luxury of marmalade. While it is clear that this man is hungry and has a tough, physically demanding job, he licks his lips and laughs, enjoying the moment, savouring the bread. He tells us that man can indeed live on bread alone. This is an adaptation a subversion of the Bible verse which tells us that we do not need food only, we need spiritual nourishment as well. The man's laughter could be seen as ironic. Who has time for the luxury of tending to your emotional or spiritual needs when you live a hand-to-mouth existence? You could also interpret the last lines as an acknowledgement of equality. Whether we're rich or poor, we delight in the sustenance that food brings. Bread is bread, with or without marmalade. Now I'll go back to the image on the first two slides. A businessman in a suit, breaking bread with a homeless, unemployed man. That phrase, breaking bread, is meaningful. Sitting down to eat with someone is a biblical instruction. It's hard to remain indifferent to someone when you've broken bread together.
let's answer some questions on the poem. Remember to write with enough detail, providing textual evidence from the poem. These questions are not difficult. The ease with which you respond to them will tell you if you have mastered the content of the poem. Pause the video here. My students have the questions printed on their lesson plan page. The rest of you can write them down, leaving about five lines open between questions for each answer. Come on, seriously, guys, pause the video. Grapple with the text before you jump to the answers. They'll be waiting for you. This question speaks to the heart of the poem. Bread is a hugely symbolic image. Our connection to bread can be said to be primal. For almost all population groups on earth, bread is a symbol of nourishment, of life. It's worth noting the Christian symbolism as well. Christians believe that Christ's crucifixion is God's gift to mankind. This act of sacrifice is commemorated in every mass or service where congregants receive the Eucharist, the body of Christ, given to them as the communion bread. The register is relatively informal, reflecting the simplicity of the topic, the humble loaf of bread. The image here is certainly one of excess, one of plenty. The addition of bread to this breakfast table is actually unnecessary, as there is more than enough food on the table already. It is, of course, in stark contrast to the meal eaten by the labourer, who has only the bread to sustain him. No spreads, not even butter. The word mauls suggests that the labourer attacks his food with great urgency. This emphasises how hungry he is. He tears off pieces of bread, in contrast to those at the breakfast table who have had their bread prepared for them. The word hunk contrasts with the slices of toast with butter and marmalade. The labourer has neither the time nor the means to cut his bread into neat slices. Another more obvious explanation for the lack of punctuation is that it adds to the simplicity, the homeliness of the diction. You know that the exam question could pair the poem with another text. Have a look at these texts. The cartoon on the left shows affluent customers at a restaurant with the excess food being eaten by poor people in the alley at the back door of the restaurant. The poster in the middle references the Bill of Rights, that everyone is entitled to healthy food. But this poster takes it further, defining food justice. Do some research on this. The final text is a verse from the Bible. Is a spiritual belief enough to sustain you? These three texts require independent thought. Chat to your friends and family about them. Listen to the opinions of other people and then form your own informed opinion.
for the unseen poem, Portrait of a Loaf of Bread could be paired with this one, The Shepherd and His Flock. Both poems deal with inequality. In this poem, the shepherd boy watches the farmer's children being driven to school and wishes that he too could get an education. As you can see, M. Charlie's poems are protest poems, but they are subtle protest poems. That's another poem done. Thank you for your time, everyone. Please forward these videos to your grade 12 peers. The more people that can benefit from them, the better. Another way to spread the word is to like and subscribe to the Mrs. M Teaches English YouTube channel. Good luck with your studies.